over 80 percent women can actually deliver normally. Vaginal birth is supposed to be eight times safer both for mother and baby, much better. Delayed cord clamping uh, means that after the baby is born, there is still uh, blood flow from the mother, to, from the placenta to the baby, and we deliberately wait for about, uh, it varies from about 50 seconds to about uh, up to five minutes, but on average about three minutes. So we let the blood flow from the mother to the baby. There are a lot of uh, women out there who don't know the process they are putting their bodies through. So if you could explain how a vaginal birth happens. Now the vaginal birth uh, to happen, uh, the preparation of the woman's body takes a long, uh, almost about four or five months before. Once the woman becomes pregnant, there is a hormone produced inside her body. Uh, this is called relaxin. Uh, it is a hormone that makes her joints very loose so that she is gradually prepared uh, that during the time of delivery, uh, the, the mother's body joints are so loose so that the baby can actually push, get pushed through. Mm. So this is the, one of the adaptations. And this is one of the causes that there is a lot of uh, fluid retention as well as joint relaxation. So the, there is the mother's body preparation. So when the baby completes its term around nine, we call it ten months in pregnancy, yes. uh, because each month we count about 28 days. So baby sub stays inside about 280 days or 40 weeks. Once that is complete, the body, the baby's uh, position also if there is presented head down and there are no other uh, risk factors. So in the process of delivery, uh, that is a selection of uh, women who can actually go for a normal delivery. The baby size is optimum in proportion to the mother's body size, pelvis size. That's a gynecologist will d determine mm -hmm. or the healthcare people will screen out. And the baby is presented by head. Mm -hmm. The amount of water is optimum. This is helped by uh, ultrasound intervention. It will tell us average, expected average birth weight amount of water, position, the placenta should not be below, placenta is all up. These are the preconditions for having a normal delivery. Now once uh, these preconditions are fulfilled, we don't, we, uh, we as a scientist also, we do not know how exactly what, uh, what triggers this labor. Mm -hmm. But it is presumed that when the baby has reached to, after 37 weeks, by uh, statistics, we know that uh, about 80% of the pregnant women will deliver two weeks before the due date. Mm -hmm. About 5% will deliver on the due date. Mm -hmm. And about 10% will deliver after the due date. So in the range, from starting from 37 weeks to 42 weeks, uh, majority will deliver before the date. A very few will deliver on the date and a, s a small proportion deliver after the due date. The reason is we don't know in each of these women what actually triggers the labor. Mm. But once the labor is triggered, we believe that it is a disproportion between the amount of hormone produced by the placenta. <coughs> Her plac the woman's placenta produces two hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Mm. Once she reaches around 37 to 40 weeks, there is a change in the ratio. Mm. And that is blamed to trigger and also the baby's body also has uh, uh, endocrine glands inside that also baby's body also produce certain uh, medicine. Mm -hmm. So in combination, one fine day, the switch is on mm -hmm. for the liver pain. Mm -hmm. So liver pain starts with a low backache. Uh, then the pain will st comes in the <coughs> back and then the pain will slowly radiate towards the lower abdomen, towards the inner thigh. And it may come once a day, slowly, slowly it will come twice a day, thrice a day, then it will, uh, the frequency will increase. So it will come that if you have three strong contractions mm -hmm. that originates in your lower back coming to the inner thigh, that is a true labor pain. Mm -hmm. That is the time that women should come to hospital. And when the uterus <coughs> contracts, there is pressure. Mm -hmm. And some women can rupture the back of water. So back of water can also rupture. 
in some before the back of water there is a mucus blood stain mucus discharge we call it show that will come out with the pain and then if she comes to hospital the anatomically what is happening is due to repeated contraction now the uterus is like a magic uh, organ mm -hmm. the mode of contraction is it doesn't contract all together mm -hmm. the contraction of the uterus starts at the top and the contraction movements starts at the top and then moves down <coughs> tries to push the baby down mm -hmm. so this is a mechanism natural mechanism so in this process the baby is pushed down on the mother's uh, uh, perineum pelvic floor mm -hmm. and then there are a lo lot of rotation negotiation angles between because the baby has to head has to turn shoulder has to turn mm -hmm. all these mechanisms occur first the baby has to descend then turning then sideways so in the process the mother's i told you the hormone of relaxant uh, hormone that prepares the mother's body for full cooperation yes. that the maximum stretching capacity is already prepared yes. so in that process the birth takes place so uh, uh, the baby we call it the passenger mm -hmm. and the birth canal we call it the passage and then the the force we call it the power so we we'll talk about three p's here mm -hmm. The power has to be optimum, the passenger has to be of average size, the passage has to be adequate. Yes. So these three P factors, we, they interplay. So if all uh, interplay synchronously, uh, then we have a successful delivery. Mm -hmm. So for the baby to pass through, one is the pelvic inlet, the pelvic girdle, mm -hmm. the bone. Yes. That is important. Once it passes through, then there is the mid pelvis. Mm -hmm. There is one rotation occurs and then the outlet so there are there are three uh, landmarks the baby has to negotiate mm -hmm. and at the end is uh, the episiotomy that mm -hmm. when if there is a threatening to tear if the baby's head is a little bigger usually in uh, first time mothers we help them with a, we put an injection uh, make the perineum area numb at the side then we cut with the scissor so that the opening is a little bit increased mm -hmm for the head to come without causing uh, unhealthy tears. Yes. So this is a, in a nutshell the process of labor. There are times when the mother is fully dilated but the baby refuses to come out. What, why do you think is a case like that? Oh yes, I told you the, the 3P factor. Yes. 3P factor is the now uh, a labor can be arrested. Labor will not progress uh, uh, as it should be because if there is problem in, in any of these three P's, yes. if the power, power is the force of contraction, if this is not adequate, then the baby will get stuck mm -hmm. uh, anywhere. Yes. If the passenger is not in the optimal position, if firstly the size of the baby has to be optimum, if the size is bigger, it will get stuck. That means it's a wrong screening. Yes. Despite the baby is of normal size, but the baby's position is not good. That means uh, when the baby is being uh, delivered through the birth canal, the chin has to chin of the baby has to be touching its own chest. Mm -hmm. This is called well flexed position. Yes. And uh, and when it negotiates, then there are some certain turning heads of the baby's head. Yes. This is called the position of the head. Though the body size is optimum, when the head position is not right, it will get stuck. The third P, the passage, the power is okay, the position of the passenger is okay, but then there is an unknown uh, contraction of the passage. If there is a contraction in the mid pelvis, mm -hmm. then the, uh, the passenger will get stuck. So these are the three uh, causes mm -hmm. that when they, any of them malfunction, the baby will get stuck. Mm -hmm. Then we call it, uh, if it is due to power, we will secondary arrest of uh, 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 the we call it dysfunctional labor. Yes. If it uh, the service then as it goes down, the service has to dilate, mm -hmm. open up. If it doesn't, then we call secondary arrest mm -hmm. of dilatation. Mm -hmm. And if the head doesn't descend down, then uh, arrest of descent from the power. So these are the three powers interplay: yeah. power, passenger, and the uh, passage. passage yes. yes, there are certain uh, indications. Uh, vacuum delivery is also. Uh, uh, it's a type of vaginal uh, birth where we help the mother to we help the uh, one of the piece we help 
it is the vacuum will help the power when the mother is really exhausted uh, she has been pushing for a long time and really tired and cannot push yes. or the mother has certain conditions like uh, she has a heart disease if she pushes too hard her heart may fail yes. so mothers with heart disease this is very common mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, when we we when we and uh, find out there are certain problems that everything has been going well with the mother who is not sick the baby has been well the labor has been progressing very well with no predetermined risk factors. Suddenly we see that the baby is not behaving well, baby is in the distress. And when we do an internal examination and we find that the mother's, uh, the passage is clearly open mm -hmm. and the passenger is halfway down. Uh, so it may be safer for the passenger to be pulled from below yes. than rather than do a caesarean and pull in the reverse. It's very difficult. Mm, yes, okay. So these are the conditions where we put a vacuum delivery. So we can do a vacuum delivery in the pre-planned, which means in the mothers who had heart disease, mm -hmm. once they reach to a stage where the, passenger, the birth passage is fully opened up, passenger has reached to a certain point where they can be pulled without mother having a, a greater a problem on her heart, yes. or in certain conditions where the baby develops distress, mm -hmm. birth passage is fully open, and then uh, a baby has uh, the position of baby is such that it is safer to be pulled from down. Mm -hmm. We use a cup mm -hmm. with a machine which creates a negative. The cup fits on the baby's head, mm -hmm. and the cup fits on the baby's head, and then through the cup there is an empty tube, mm -hmm. and a negative vacuum is created. That negative vacuum actually sucks the baby's uh, mm -hmm. head into that. And th there is a predetermined pressure that up to what level the vacuum can be created. Mm -hmm and how forcefully uh, uh, can somebody pull it, we have already predetermined. We have an operating uh, procedure for that one. So we tell the mother that we have an option, the 50-50 chance, your baby needs uh, immediate delivery. Uh, there's a very good chance, if you agree, I will use this. Mm -hmm. It's not that we blindly use without informing the mother. Yes. If the mother says, okay, then we sign a consent. Okay, mm -hmm. mother agrees that there's a 50% chance, then we pull a maximum of three times. Once the cup is nicely stuck on the head, we give a good about 10 to 13 kg weight is given to the uh, cup and we try to pull it. With every pull, there has to be descent. Yes. If there is a good descent, then we go for the second. If there is good descent, we go for the third and deliver. Yes. If there is no good descent with the first pull, then we ask the mother, we will try the second one. The second pull, no descent, method is abandoned. Mm -hmm. Then we go for a caesarean delivery. So this is a scenario about using a vacuum delivery. The episiotomy, is that, the, is that considered better than the natural tear? No, episiotomy is uh, one that I explained earlier that uh, when the mother's perineum mm -hmm. mm, is stretched out and the head uh, is coming and is not being able to come out with the contractions and then if it comes the, it has to tear and come out mm -hmm. so we call it the threat to tear mm -hmm. so that is a, a, a in indication that we deliberately uh, put an injection and then uh, make a small area of skin uh, painless and then we cut with a scissor so that the head can come out without uh, causing a tear and then after the baby is born, we again stitch this cut layer in uh, three layers very nicely so the mother uh, doesn't get a painful scar later. Yes, okay. Now there are two schools of thought. If a uh, tear is quite small from a natural uh, birth, people, uh, there is one school says that mothers do much better without actually deliberating cutting the uh, episiotomy. If the tear is small. Mm -hmm. But then from a scientific point of view, we do not know that how bad this tear will go. Mm. So if, if, she, if somebody has a tear during the process of childbirth, we classify them in four categories. Yes. One is uh, only the small tiny area of the skin is torn, yes. which is okay. That doesn't, may, may not even need repairing. Second is the tear extends down into the muscle layer. 
that means a whole perineum from the introitus from the vaginal outside canal is torn down to deep to the muscles it may involve the pelvic floor muscles may be torn second the third degree tear is the tear extends from the birth canal to the anal canal even mm. even the anal canal there is some muscles to mm, and we yes. call it anal sphincter mm -hmm. these are torn so this is a third degree perineum now the fourth degree tear is it tears the not only the birth canal the perineum pelvic muscles torn the anal canal is torn and even the tear extends to the rectum mm. so it makes the uh, you can uh, almost it makes the vagina and the rectum uh, together yes. the tear has just sliced in between and everything is torn mm. this is called fourth degree perineal tear very very bad tear mm. so we actually do not know when the head is coming what type of tear this mother will have I now if this it. mother has a third degree tear Four degree tear, this mother needs to be taken to the theater and repaired mm -hmm. again. So after uh, um, the uh, so to avoid the complications, if she is in the hospital with that tear, then she, it will get repaired. If this is undetected, then this is going to be a source of infection, mm -hmm. and then there is a long term complication of inability to control flatters and uh, stool later in life. Mm -hmm. So these are the real risks from the tear. So in order to avoid this tear, in a woman, uh, what we practice is in a woman who is delivering, and if we see that there's a threat to tear, then we give episiotomy. Yes, yes. So that saves the third degree and fourth degree perineal tear. Mm. So yes. this is the reason. But we also do not give uh, episiotomy to all the women who, who come for delivery on a routine basis, no. Yes. It is only given for women whose perineum is quite small and who is, uh, if we don't give that, there's a, a risk of having a tear. Yes.